Now, Ask Dr. Love with psychotherapist, author, love and relationship expert, Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Hello again and welcome to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf and it's my pleasure to be with you again today. I'm talking about how understanding creates long-standing love. That's a tongue twister. Try saying that one three times fast. I'm also talking about how to put yourself in your partner's emotional shoes and create a happy relationship to boot. Now, did you know that happy couples regularly enter each other's emotional realities by making the effort to see from each other's vantage points? Now, the technical name for this skill is partial identification. And what the skill entails is keeping one foot on your side of the emotional fence while at the same time stepping into your partner's emotional shoes. No relationship can thrive without this skill. But unfortunately, in distressed relationships, partners never partially identify with each other. Instead, they ram their individual realities down each other's throats, which leads to wringing each other's necks. Now, because partial identification is the master key to ending your fights and to long-lasting love, you're going to want to stick with me so you can learn how to master this skill. And by the way, this skill of partial identification is going to improve your relationships with friends, family, and even your kids. All right, now I've got some columns for you. And don't forget, I always give priority to anybody who wants to call me live. And if it means that I don't get to some of the uh, columns that are the columns of the week, you can find these answers on my website under latest columns. And then that way I can still take your call and you can read these questions if we don't get to them. So the first one is, my husband always talks about his ex. And here I'm helping out a wife whose feelings are hurt by her husband's frequent mention of his exes. So stick around to discover the real reason he's talking about his exes and what she needs to do about it. And I'm not talking about cutting out his, his tongue to get him to stop. There's another solution. The next question I'm going to answer is, not sure how to read a shy guy. And in this question, I'm helping a young woman figure out how to decipher the mixed signals that a guy in her poetry class is sending her. Now, partial identification skills are going to come in handy for her. The third question is, my girlfriend wants her own space. And here I'm helping out a guy whose girlfriend, without warning, said she wants space. And he wants to know what he should do. Well, to know what to do, he has to first understand what's going on in her head. More partial identification. And, of course, reading between the sheets. Can't have a Dr. Love show without reading between the sheets. This one's called I'm Stumped. And I'm helping a wife whose husband gives her no attention whatsoever and yet expects her to give him hot and cold running sex. So stay tuned to find out how, how she should handle this uh, neglectful but rather horny husband. Now let's get on to today's topic, partial identification. What on earth does this fancy term mean? Now, as I said a couple seconds ago, partial identification is the technical name for putting yourself in another person's emotional shoes. Now, to partially identify, we have to put temporarily our own thoughts feelings, needs, and wishes on the side. We put them on the back burner, and we simply focus on deeply understanding someone else. Now, I want to invite you to stretch your heart muscle and access that deep well of love that's inside you. And it is your love that's going to enable you to create this nesting place in your heart for your partner or anybody else, friends, family, co-workers, everybody, your kids, strangers, anyone. Find that nesting place where you seek to understand the other and just temporarily put your own thoughts, feelings, and whatever in the bottom drawer. Now, when I speak about partial identification, I am not talking about total identification because that's a total and complete wiping out of yourself, making you a clone of the other person, which means you lose yourself and merge with the other. We don't want that. I mean, there are rare moments of merger in life when we have an infant in our arms and we're a mother, there you're totally one with the baby. The baby hasn't separated. And then we have merger when we're having physical um, and sexual involvement with someone else, okay? Now, those rare moments also might occur when you're walking in the moon, under the moon, you're having a moonlit stroll on the beach. Now, these moments are vital to reinforcing 
your mutual bond and creating a sense of unity, but you shouldn't strive to live in this state of oneness because in fact, living under the illusion that you are one with your partner or anybody else actually creates conflict because you end up wiping out the other person by assuming that your partner feels the way you do or wants what you want when in fact he or she doesn't. And being wiped out is so infuriating for the wipey, that's the person who's being wiped out, that it actually creates relationship distress. Now, a good example of the way total merger can wipe out the other is a former patient of mine who early in his marriage went bungee jumping with his wife. And on their first jump, he discovered that that she was rather klutzy. <laughs> and it was obvious that this sport was going to be too danger for, dangerous for her. So here's where he threw himself off the cliff. He figured that she would be hurt if he were to practice the sport without her because he would have felt that way had the tables been turned. So he was making a total identification with her and figuring that she would be feeling hurt and wiped out. So he just quit the bungee jumping. And guess what? He grew angry and resentful over the sacrifice, and years later he came to me for therapy. But by this point he was so furious with her because of the sacrifice he'd made to give up bungee jumping and other things along the way. Now he was ready to jump ship and leave the marriage. So hearing this story, I was pretty sure that he'd made the mistake of making a total identification with his wife in which he wrongly assumed that she would have resented his continuing the sport even if she didn't. And I told him that he was pissed at her for a sacrifice that he made voluntarily and without checking with her to see that she wanted the sacrifice. So he checked and sure enough, she could have cared less about bungee jumping. So he resumed the sport and they lived happily ever after. You get the point. So you don't want total identification and merger, but what you do want is to cultivate the skill of partial identification. And yes, it's a skill, not just a concept. And here you're putting your one foot on your partner, your friends, your kids, your siblings. You're putting one foot on those people's side of the fence, but you're keeping your other foot firmly planted on your side of the fence as well. So you don't forget who you are, what you think and feel and want. Now with this skill, you're going to consciously join with your partner or anyone else you wish to connect better with and you're going to work to understand that person's reality. And when you're doing this, um, you're going to be dealing with more than feelings and actual decisions and choices. You're going to be partially identifying with the other person. You're going to be listening, truly listening to him or her. And you're going to combine your differences so if you have a conflict, you're going to come up with an arrangement that works for everyone. Now, partial identification is easiest to achieve when the person you're dealing with is most similar to you because let's say you're of the same sex or you share a similar life experience or cultural, religious, or moral values or if, you're, if you belong to a similar social class. But even when you look the same on paper, differences are going to occur. And if you use this skill of partial identification, you're going to be able to resolve any issues that come up and you're going to stay connected emotionally. So, are you chomping at the bit to know how to add partial identification to your interpersonal skills arsenal? Well, just a minute. Before I teach you how to master the skill, I want to give you a couple of partial identification pointers, okay? And the second thing is I want you to promise yourself that you're going to make a practice of ditching your defensiveness. And this is because defensiveness is the enemy of partial identification. Plain and simple, if you're defensive, you aren't listening and you aren't ident partially identifying. So here's a word of warning. It's going to be especially hard for you to not get defensive and partially identify with someone else's feelings when those feelings are related to you and something you said or did. But I still want you to make it your mantra to not get defensive. So let me give you a couple of anecdotes um, to, oh, these are antidotes, not anecdotes, antidotes to defensiveness. First, I want you to remember, somebody comes and tells you he or she feels X, Y, or Z about something you said or did. Remember that feelings aren't wrong or right. They are simply the other person's emotional reality. And you simply need to put yourself in the other's emotional shoes, listen and understand. And it helps to also remember that feelings are nothing more than the wind. They blow east, they blow west, they blow north, they blow south. And you wouldn't think to say to the west wind, you're right, and the east wind, you're wrong. Well, the wind is just the wind. It just is. 
And I often also compare feelings to farts. You know, they come and they go. Some are really strong and stinky, but feelings like gas pass. So don't give too much power and importance to them. Like the wind, they also blow over. Now, uh, remember also when you're being asked to partially identify with feelings that you had a hand in inflicting, in addition to not being defensive, you're also going to need to accept responsibility for the effect that your words or actions had. Now let me give you an example that's going to help you listen and accept responsibility for the feelings that your words or actions stirred in someone else. So imagine you and I are walking down the street and you trip and you fall on my foot and you break it. Okay? You didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. And even though you didn't mean to hurt me, my foot still hurts. So aren't I entitled to cry out in pain? My paining foot exists despite, despite your good intentions. Feelings are no different. We're constantly and unwittingly tripping on each other's emotional feet and causing pain and ripping open old scars from childhood. So we need to allow others to share their pain with us, especially when we're the source of that pain. And as we listen and understand, we're putting ourselves in each other's shoes and sharing each other's pain. And this is how we help each other to heal the current pain, as well as the old scars that the current offense triggered. And as we offer this gift, our bonus is the fact that we're resolving our conflicts and strengthening our bonds with each other. Now, one final pointer about partial identification. I know it's hard to partially identify when you're angry. So in order for you to be ready to partially identify, I want you to dig up feelings of love so you can create the emotional climate in yourself that you need to be loving and listening, okay? So what you're reaching for here is to join the ranks of the most spiritually and emotionally evolved people, all of whom have the patience to temporarily put their feelings of anger aside, tuck them in the emotional bottom drawer of our psyches, and for the moment just listen and partially identify with the other person. And know that when you model this degree of maturity, your gift is going to be returned to you, and you will be heard in turn unless you have a total broken-winged bird for a partner. So now, I'm partially identifying with you, and I'm imagining that you're thinking, I'm ready to learn the skill. So let me give you a couple of exercises for per perfecting this skill of partial identification. Now, make sure you practice the skill during times when you're calm, before a conflict erupts, because this way, the skill is going to be under your belt when the chips are down and the stakes are high, meaning somebody close to you is counting on you to uh, partially identify with him or her and really needs you. So the first exercise is going to be, Choose an area of conflict and switch roles. You play your partner or the other person's part and vice versa. Be patient and speak your partner's truth, his or her thoughts and feelings. And by the time you finish this exercise, you're going to be surprised at how well you actually do in understanding the other person. Now, second partial identification exercise. If you can't understand how your partner feels on a topic, strip away the content and just focus on the feeling. And then come up with a situation from your own life that triggers that same feeling. And once you have accessed the feeling in yourself and you're swimming in that feeling, then you can focus on the fact that your partner feels that same emotion. Understanding another person's feelings is the essence of partial identification, right? So the better you partially identify with others, the stronger and more loving your relationships are going to be. And if you make sure this skill is under your belt, you won't hit each other below the belt the next time conflict erupts. And who wants a black belt in relationship fighting? So partially identify with others, and you and your relationships are going to reap the rewards. Get it? And it's easier, and it, it's easier than you think, and practice makes perfect. That's the beauty of all the relationship skills that I'm teaching you. At first, we have no relationship muscle at all. We can't bear any emotional weight. We can't sit on our feelings. But as we practice, we're able to do it and listen to others and hold our feelings in abeyance. All right, I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Hello again and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm talking with you today about how understanding creates long-standing love. This is the time in the show I call Dr. Love's Quickie. You know why. It's short and sweet. Or should I say short and tweet? Because I always share my tweets on the topic of the week to help cement the notions that I'm teaching you. Cement them in your brain. You know, before I give you some tweets, I wanted to tell you something very interesting that happened to me. I promised in my newsletter I would talk about this. On Sunday, I went 
to meet a young woman at brunch. I've known her since she was a little, little girl. And she's a lovely person. So here we are at the restaurant. And she's 30 now. I've known her, as I said, since she was a, almost a, you know, she was a preteen. And every relationship she's been in has been devastatingly painful to her. Every man that she's with is unavailable, can't commit, doesn't come around. And she was so excited this time to be able to tell me the great story of her love affair and how it was working so well. And as she walks in the door, she bursts into tears, falls in my arms, and she's weeping because she broke up with the guy, or more like he broke up with her. Now, I'm sitting at the table with her, and her mom's there too. And she tells the story of the relationship. And the guy gave her a clue at the very first moment that he met her. He said, all my relationships end because I don't have enough passion inside me. Or I always feel there isn't enough passion. He didn't say I don't have enough passion in me. He just said, they all seem to be without passion. And so I end it. And obviously the common denominator in all his relationships is him. He's the guy who's walled off from passion. His parents divorce. He's afraid to get attached and be heartbroken. So he doesn't allow himself to be alive. He's in psychological anesthesia, armoring himself, and he's dead. Okay. So he gave her a clue that this guy was not going to be there for her. He was not going to be able to come around. And sure enough, that's why he ended it. There wasn't enough passion. And she's all hurting. And she tells me, all the things that she tried to do to make this relationship work, to try to be there for him, to give him room, to partially identify with him up to the wall, up and beyond and over the moon. In other words, she was trying to uh, fix this guy's old scars and win him. This was her old scar because as we talked, it became clear she was repeating her mother's marriage with an unavailable father. And then her old mother's old scar became hers. And in an attempt to partially identify with the other, she was really just enabling his abuse and abandonment of her. That I talk about all the time in Kiss Your Fights Goodbye. How we think we have the power to fix the other person. And then if we do, it'll feel like we finally won the love and attention we never got as kids because dad wasn't available to mom and also wasn't available to her. So beware of using partial identification under the guise of, really trying to heal an old scar. That's a very deep thing. Think about it. All right, let me give you a couple tweets. For a relationship that wins, you got to travel many miles in your mate's moccasins. <laughs> and partial identification is the master key that creates a solid we. You know what I mean by that, right? Because if we're not partially identifying, we are two separate people constantly fighting and fighting and vying, right? Instead of being a we. It's more important to win a fight. Oh, this is a question. This is a tweet that's a question that I wrote. Is it more important to win a fight or to have a relationship that's tight? You tell me. What do you think? Lots of people are more into winning, but they lose the relationship. Here's another one for you. Ramming your opinion down your partner's throat is going to lead to sinking of your love boat. And last but not least, instead of hitting each other below the belt, put partial identification skills beneath your belt. How about that? You like that one? I like that one. All right, so what can I say to you now? I want to just, before, before I go to a break, I want to underscore again the danger that we all get into when we have old scars. We try desperately to fix the wounds that we suffered as kids by choosing a partner who's exactly like the, the parent who let us down. And then we set out to partially identify, be there for the person, blame ourselves, try harder to be good and giving. All of this is a sign you're in a repetition compulsion and you're trying to heal an old scar. And if you see yourself repeatedly trying to get blood from a stone or water from an empty well or having a leopard change its spots, you know that you are in a repetition compulsion and it ain't working. It ain't working because, you know, there's the old saying, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? One, but the light bulbs really got to want to change. The other person has to want to change the way he or she is and is not going to change because you are on an agenda to try to pull, pull, you know, the love out of this person that you never got as a kid. 
So I hope that that's clear what I'm saying to you. So don't partially identify, rescue, and caretake somebody who is just unresponsive and unavailable to you. All right, I'm going to take a brief break, and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Hello again, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and it's my pleasure to be with you. We're talking about how understanding creates long-standing love, and this is the time in the show where I answer your questions. So the first question that I've selected is called, My Husband Always Talks With His Ex. Here's the question. Dear Dr. Love, thanks to your site, at least it's going to give me a clear mind. If only my site could do this. I'm just thinking, it's me. I'm the only one doing it. So I've been married for seven months. My husband and I are living together. We have no kids yet. We have two grown-up kids and his girlfriend before. He didn't marry the woman and he got married twice and got divorced twice as well. And now that we're living together, he always talks about his ex. Not just his exes, but as well, his past girlfriends. And I'm the sort of person who doesn't like to talk about my ex because I don't really see a point of talking about it as it's past. And if he asks me about my ex-boyfriend, well, that's the only time I talk, and it's just a brief a brief one not to extend that everything my ex-boyfriend did to me but uh, on his part he talks about his ex-girlfriend like he used to date this ex-girlfriend and he picked her up in her job place and he talked took he um took her to her flat he talks about his ex-wife has how his ex-wife messed up his life and when he talks about his ex-girlfriend he tells me that the girl reminds him so much of his ex-wife come on dr love we're not kids here why does he always talk about his past what does my husband want to emphasize here? And be honest, it does hurt me. But the problem with me is I just keep it inside of me and I started to feel upset and questions started flying in my mind like at bedtime. And sometimes I ask myself if he respects my feelings and should I tell him to stop talking about all of his exes and that his, he's married already and instead of having a little conversation all the time, just keep it to a normal talk instead of talking about what happened to him and his exes. I'm not happy with my feelings and this doesn't happen once. It happens many, many times and I'm fed up. So thank you for taking the time to read my letter and all the best to your site. And you signed it, Confused and Hurting. Okay, so I'm really, really sorry that your feelings are hurt. Now, the reason your feelings are hurt is because you're falling into what I call excessive personalization. Now, how do I know this? When you say that you wonder if he respects your feelings, you're interpreting his discussion about his former wives and girlfriends as his way of purposely disrespecting you, okay? Now, could there be another interpretation for his behavior that has nothing to do with you? In other words, could he be, as most people are, self-absorbed and just speaking out loud to himself? Did you get that? Most people, we think they're talking out loud, they're looking us in the face, we think they're talking to us, they're talking out loud to themselves. They're filled and churning up on the inside with all kinds of emotions and anxiety and unresolved stuff that they carry from childhood on up to the present and it's just present and it's just spewing out. And so often we make the mistake of thinking that people are talking to us when they're actually venting whatever's troubling them and doing what they need to do to get some relief from their internal emotional pressure. So he's just venting his, his own pain and you just happen to be in the vicinity to hear it. And I'm betting that he's carrying some feeling that's unresolved regarding his exes. Maybe he feels hurt, wronged, and angry. And the bottom line is we don't keep ruminating and mentally revisiting issues and people from our past unless we're feeling hurt and unresolved. I could be wrong and you could be married to a guy who's mean and likes to make you jealous, but I'm not banking on that theory. Now, let's move on to your next question about whether you should tell him to stop talking about his exes. Well, first of all, nobody likes to be told what to do. So if you can't tell him to button his lip, what can you do? Talk! Now, if you notice, you told me that you keep your feelings inside, and this habit of yours is only making your issue mushroom. When you talk, you could go the route of telling him straight out how you're feeling about what he's saying, but if you tell him that you're feeling disrespected, he's going to feel attacked and become defensive, especially since I don't think he means to hurt you. And if he becomes defensive, he's not going to hear you at all. So I think the better approach is to focus on the fact that he doesn't even know how you feel. I'm talking about the fact that your guy lacks what I call partial identification skills. Now, again, it means he hasn't learned to put himself in your emotional shoes and think before he speaks. And this skill needs to be developed, and you're just the person who can help him do it. 
So rather than tell him how you feel about what he's saying, which won't develop partial identification in him, I suggest another type of communication that's going to help him realize how you're feeling without your having to spell it out. And this way, you'll be killing two birds with one stone. You're going to be developing his partial identification skills and cluing him in on how you feel at the same time and all without sparking defensiveness. Sound good? Where do I sign? Okay. So to do this, you're going to ask a question like, when you speak about your exes, I'm sh not sure how you want me to feel. Now at this point, you can check out your interpretation by saying, do you want me to feel hurt or disrespected? Now when you ask this question, it's going to wake him up to the fact that you are feeling hurt and disrespected. But then he'll say, of course I don't intend this. This way, he'll realize how you're feeling without your making him feel attacked. And then once you're talking, you could ask him, what's still troubling him? Now getting him to talk about the unresolved will help him put the old business behind him. Now my book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, is going to give you even more pointers on how you can talk to him so that he's going to want to listen and not become defensive and how you can listen to him and help him put his exes permanently behind you and him. Okay, I've given you the whole blueprint for how to solve the problem, develop partial identification in him, and live happily ever after. All right, so write me back at the site and let me know how well you're doing. All right, next question is, my girlfriend wants her own space. Dear Dr. Love, I've, I've had a girlfriend whom I love so dearly in my heart. But last week, she told me that she wanted her own space and wants to be single for the time being. And I realized that sometimes I'm too pushy on her, which is something I regret, like texting her and calling her, not realizing that she was busy. So yesterday, I texted her again to start all over, and she said that she does not want... Um, it's not, she said that, not that she doesn't want, but she needs her own space and to not rush and to take it slowly and starting all over again. And she mentioned that she needs to be alone at the time being. So she asked me to respect her decision and not disturb her for the time being. And I don't know what to do as I'm helpless. Please help me. Okay, so listen, my dear friend, all is not loss. Because your girlfriend didn't say that she doesn't want to be with you. She said she needs some breathing room. And I sense that she's testing to see whether you're going to give her the room she needs or not. Because she clearly said she's not done. Now, I sense you're on the verge of engaging in the very behavior that caused her to want to step back. Because you are, in fact, on the verge of crowding her all over again by reaching out to her. Now, here's the case in which your needs are causing you to not partially identify with her. Because she's feeling crowded by you because your own needs are preventing you from putting yourself in her shoes. And this is because you're drowning in your own feelings, which are blinding you from seeing her and her needs. Now, what are her feelings? I sense also that you're in a state of anxiety and uh, over being separated from her. And I suspect that this anxiety also existed when you were together. And I bet that each time she tried to pull away from you and take some room, you became anxious that you were losing her love. Now, unfortunately, your anxiety caused you to crowd her with texts and other forms of contact, which was an unconscious attempt to ease your own insecurity, but the attempts you made to re reassure yourself backfired big time. And what's happened was an unfortunate vicious cycle because the more you crowded her, the more she wanted to pull away, which made you more anxious and then you crowded her more. See what I mean? Now, if you give her the space she wants now, she'll know that she can return to you and have some breathing room in the relationship. And that's the only way you're going to save the day with her. But here's the catch. The very problem that made you crowd her when you were together is still going strong inside you. So we need to understand and resolve this problem or you're, gonna, or you're going to be you aren't going to be able to win her back, nor will you be able to keep any other woman. So let me explain your problem to you. I said a moment ago that you're in a state of anxiety whenever your girl tries to get some breathing room. Now, her backing away triggers something called separation anxiety. And the origin of this problem can be traced back to early childhood. 
without drowning you in psychological theory, I'm just going to give you the broad strokes, okay? Around 18 to 24 months of age, all children begin to foray or stray away from the mother. Now, this is the separation individuation phase, pop popularly known as the terrible twos, okay? During this phase, the only way the child can separate is because he knows that mom isn't far away and that he can run back to her at any moment to receive reassurance and love. Now, the theorist Margaret Mahler studied this phase and she discovered that certain mothers who themselves haven't properly mastered this phase for themselves actually cling to their kids and don't allow them to separate. And these mothers are called rapprochement mothers because they actually punish their kids for trying to move away from them by giving them the cold shoulder and not being there for them when the kid returns for support. And this results in a child who is fearful, clingy, and unable to separate because he doesn't feel secure enough in his mother's love. And as an adult, this person is going to have problems in adult relationships and the problem will often take the form of fear of abandonment which leads to clingy, needy, anxious behavior that is triggered by the other partner's attempts to get breathing room. Sound familiar? So this explains why you get anxious when you're separated from your girlfriend, why you have to make frequent contact with her to be sure she's still close to you and still loves you, and why you become anxious when she wants some room, because you feel like she's abandoning you. So now that you understand the real cause of the problem, what can we do to heal it? So it's time for you to sign the adoption papers for your own scared little inner child. And from now on, each time you become scared, you need to mentally imagine yourself squatting down and scooping up the scared little boy inside you and remind him that you're not abandoning him, you're holding him, you're loving him, and as you take care of him in this way, your anxiety is going to ease. The point is, we don't want to bring this wounded boy to her. His needy, clingy behavior is driving her away, which only injures him more. And as you care for him, this little inner boy, and as you become less anxious and clingy, she's going to feel the difference and she's going to breathe a sigh of relief. And then we'll have our happy ending because your inner child will be healed and you'll be back together. So please promise to write me at the site and tell me your good news because I've had thousands and thousands of patients over the years with exactly your problem. And healing your old scar is the very way to make this relationship work. And if you need more help with this, my book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, actually has a chapter that is really neat. There's nothing like this in any other book out there. In addition to uh, describing all the old scars that all of us have and bring to our adult relationships, I show you how those old scars express themselves in our adult relationships. So in your case, you would see that, yes, I'm clingy, I'm needy. When she wants space, I get scared. She's not loving me. She's abandoning me. Yeah. And then I show you step by step what to do to heal the old scar and I've given you some clues here about doing the inner child healing and I know it might sound weird to a grown-up man or woman to imagine yourself um, healing the inner child so it's almost like you have to split yourself in two okay and then you have the grown-up you visualizing the inner child that still lives inside you. It's kind of like a Sybil thing. You split yourself in half and the grown-up you comes to the young part of you and heals and comforts that young part of you. And the beautiful thing about this is as you become more and more healed, your relationship becomes healthier and more loving. And if you have an open relationship with the partner where you're really sharing your emotional truth, you can share the truth of what you're working on with your partner and even bring the partner in. That's what I show you how to do in Kiss Your Fights Goodbye. So you use the relationship as a healing agent. So in, if your girlfriend is open to it, you would say, you know what? I realized why I was not giving you room. My mom or dad left me when I was young. And um, that's why I get nervous when you need space. And then if you have a partner who wants to work with you, the partner would be able to take space in a way that reassures your inner child by saying, I just want you to know I'm taking my space, but I still love you. I'm not abandoning you. So you see, when you have a partner working on helping the healing progress and you're working yourself to help the inner child heal, you've got a win-win combination. All righty. So uh, let me just check now because I don't know, my next break's at 41, so I don't think 
I have time to start a new question. I'm going to take a break, and I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Hello again, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and it's my pleasure to be with you again. Uh, we're talking about how understanding creates long-standing love. And I'm at the portion of the show where I'm answering your questions. You know, I wish I could answer every question that comes in. So I just hope you know that, that I hold each and every one of you in my heart. And search my archives. You know, if I'm not able to answer the question that you submit to me, do check the archives because there's a good chance you're going to find an answer in there to a question very much like yours. And if you're really stuck and you need to reach out to me, of course, you can always contact me in private consulting. It's one of the drop-down menus on my homepage. All right, here's the next question. Uh, Hello, Dr. Love. The title of this is Not Sure How to Read a Shy Guy. Hello, Dr. Love. I truly need your advice. There's a very attractive boy in my poetry class. I recognized him the first day from a party I was at and where he, according to my friends, was looking at me but made a strange comment referring to my clothes. I'm not exactly sure what he said, but I do know it wasn't a nice comment. So first day of class, he sat beside me and I could see him looking at me like he recognized me. Second class, he sat as far away from me as he possibly could. For at least two weeks, he sat away from me, but he would look at me. My friend started to notice this. That's how much he looked. Anyways, I made it late to class, and he was sitting in my seat, so I took the seat beside him. Awkward silence until I introduced myself. He was very nice, shook my hand, and told me his name. He seemed a little nervous, but he smiled a lot, and I thought things went well. Next class rolled around, and he sat on the other side of the room again. On break, I left to use the washroom, and I ran into him. He just looked at me, didn't smile, didn't say anything, just walked away. Finally, my latest class proved to be very interesting. I was there early, and he sat beside me when there were other seats open. On break, I got up to go talk to my friends on the other side of the room, and he was looking at me again. And then, the end of the class, I said I liked his T-shirt, and he seemed impressed that I knew the band on his T-shirt. It looked like he started to blush, and he went a little red in the cheeks, and then he started to walk away awkwardly, and the whole thing just seemed strange, yet good. So you're asking me, what's the deal? So sure sounds to me like the dude likes you. And here's another instance where partial identification skills are going to come in handy. So put yourself in his shoes and imagine how terrified the poor guy is. He likes you and he doesn't have a clue as to how to go about winning you. He's probably also nursing a big, big case of fear of rejection as well. So he needs a helping hand from you. You're going to need to make the first move. He needs to be hit over the head with a love hammer in order to know without a doubt that you like him. Give him lots of what I call green lights, which include approachable body language, smiling, facing him, asking him interested questions, and saying positive things to him. And if that doesn't move the mountain, then we'll have to get a stick of dynamite. But it should, he should be able to move forward if you offer him the training wheels that I outlined. Okay? All right. I think I have time today. Um, some of the questions were a little shorter, so I have some time to throw in some more. So here's another one. Um, here's my story. I became friends with a guy while traveling and teaching English in Korea. We had everything in common and our personalities were very similar. He was very flirty and always hinted at a fling. But the problem is that I was a virgin and he had just come out of a really bad breakup with his ex and he was very depressed and always complaining about her. So I think he was looking to me as a temporary distraction and he also technically um, he was also technically still married. I rejected him at one point when he made a move on me because I really didn't want to have a fling or want him to know I was a virgin. But we kept hanging out as friends regardless and seemed to get even closer. As we hung out more and more, I slowly fell for him. I kept trying to repress my feelings, but they came out in full force right as he was about to leave Korea and return home. By the time I realized how interested I always was in him, it was too late. I eventually hinted at my feelings in an email and went to visit him in Spain, where he had moved to. This time, I was the one that suggested sleeping with him. He didn't know I was a virgin, but assumed I was the type that wa would want a relationship. And when I brought up us sleeping together, I was shocked that he turned me down this time. Not sure if he was getting back at me for rejecting him previously, but he claimed he didn't want to hurt me or get himself hurt. So I left Spain and nothing happened between us. After that, I just couldn't seem to get over him, and we stayed in touch on Facebook. 
About six months later, after I returned to Canada, I revealed all my feelings to him. I told him I was in love with him. He didn't seem to have a favor favorable reaction to that. I told him I was a virgin, which was the reason I turned him down and it, that he was the only one I now want to have sex with. So I've revealed everything there is to reveal to him. Now he wants me to come back to Spain so he can be my first. He's a casual type guy and doesn't seem the type to want uh, a relationship. And actually, um, I find it strange that I, um, that I tell him I'm in love with him and yet he has no problem with the thought of just having a fling with me, even though he knows I'm a virgin. Now, should I be expecting anything more from this man just um, other than a one-time fling? Or do you think it's possible that after sleeping with him, the dynamics of the relationship are going to change and we'll end up together? Or worse, that sex will ruin our friendship and we'll never talk again? Um, our friendship seems to be quite strong, unbreakable, and we're already quite bonded, so I'm not sure if sleeping together is going to ruin things or not. And I'm also surprised he rejects me at one point, only now to want to sleep with me a year later after I practically admitted to being in love. And the fact that I'm a virgin doesn't seem to bother him at all. And I'm guessing I have the stronger feelings, and he's just viewing it as sex. So maybe it is a bad idea to lose my virginity to him, but he's the only guy I've ever been this close to and had feelings for. So I, do I take a risk that maybe something will work out and um, or not bother? Okay, so listen. You are absolutely right to say that you are in, you're wondering, and you should really, really, really keep your knees together, girlfriend, because this guy is danger, 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 written all over him. It's danger, Will Rogers. You are in danger. So listen to what you told me. You proposed sex to him in Spain, and he refused because he knew that you wanted a relationship, and he didn't want to hurt you or himself. Then you told him you loved him, and he didn't have a favorable reaction. And after you told him that you only wanted to have sex with him, he offered to be your first. So I'm afraid you are in great emotional danger. If you're hoping that sex is going to forge a romantic relationship with him, don't count on it. This guy is casual, as you said, and he also sounds too frightened to allow himself to become involved. And he all but said so to you when he said that he didn't want to get hurt. So the bottom line is, you're playing with fire. Sex with him is never going to be casual for you. You love the man. Losing your virginity to a man you love is only going to heighten your feelings. And if you're doing this hoping that he's going to come around, don't. Don't kid yourself into believing that you could have casual sex with him and walk away. Because the not only is that not likely to happen, it's something that you shouldn't aspire to. Because you don't want to cut off or compartmentalize your emotions in this way. Sex is supposed to be the consummation, which means the bringing to completion of a relationship. And you don't have a relationship with him. And if you're hoping for a relationship, then tell him so before you take the plunge or let him take the plunge. Straight out ask him if he's on the same page. And if he says that he doesn't want anything other than a casual fling, then know what you're in for before you let him in. And my final message to you is this. You deserve a man who returns your love. No matter how much you're attracted to him, that's not a good enough reason to sleep with him, much less lose your virginity to him. So protect yourself and protect your heart, okay? All right, so let's see. I have a reading between the sheets question for you. It's called, I'm Stumped. Dear Dr. Love, I've been married for six years and I have an eight month old girl and our marriage is in serious trouble. As much as we've shared, I just cannot stand to be around him most of the time. We've undergone a tremendous amount of stress in the past year. We bought a house, it's too expensive. I've lost three jobs, we're running out of dough. Before all this, we were on rocky ground. He's emotionally unavailable and stays that way despite my requests to be heard. He just wants sex. Well, I want to balance it out with foreplay and romance. He says I'm too emotional, yet he cannot handle hearing the baby cry. Um, I don't know what to do. I want to leave him, but he says that we should stay together no matter what for the baby. I disagree. If one of us is unhappy, then we should work something else out. I know I can't be unreasonable and stubborn, but even his friends have made comments to me about his behavior. He acts like he cannot grow up, wants to spend all his time playing video games, listening to music, and that wouldn't be a problem if he did things with the family, but he doesn't. He just stares at the TV and won't engage in conversations, and I am stumped. Please help. I sense I have a repetition problem on my end, but I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think about his end. Okay, <clears throat> now you say to me, you sense a repetition compulsion is operating for you. 
meaning that your relationship with your husband is recreating a relationship with a parent who wasn't responsive to your emotional needs. Now this is a pretty serious realization to make, and yet you're quick to move off of yourself and back onto him, saying, I don't know what to think about his end. The fact that you focus back on him tells me just how serious the repetition compulsion is, because trying to understand why he acts the way he does is a clue that you're stuck, still locked into trying to fix him. The thought being, if only I could understand why he acts the way he does, I could say or do something to change him, and finally get the love and responsiveness that I've always craved since I was a child. So hear me, and hear me good. I can make all kinds of guesses about what makes him tick, and we can psychoanalyze him up the yin-yang, but the question is, so what? If he isn't interested in understanding himself, if he doesn't care to change the behaviors that are upsetting you, if he doesn't care to be more responsive to you, if he isn't interested in understanding why he's so self-consumed that he can't give you the fan or the family any attention, what get good is your understanding of him? He needs to get off the dime and work on himself in the marriage, and he isn't going to do this work on himself as long as you are so willing to try to fix him. Now, if you're ready to have your needs met and you're ready to stop trying to get blood from a stone, then you're going to need to relate to him very differently. And the different approach is going to entail showing him in words and actions that your needs count and that you won't stand for his emotional neglect. And you haven't reached the point in your own self-growth where you're ready to convey the message to him that your needs will be satisfied with or without him. Now, how do I know? because you quoted to me his statement that you need to stay together for the sake of the child, and then you all but ask me if he is right. This tells me that you don't yet feel entitled to take care of yourself, with or without him, child or no child. Now, if you want him to get the message that he needs to work on himself and treat you better if he wants to keep you, you need to first believe that you are entitled to better treatment and that you will see to it that your needs are met, with or without him. Now, how can you convey this message? Well, you have to start by loving yourself enough to take care of yourself. Create friendships with people who feed you emotionally. Go out, take courses, do whatever makes you happy, and stop waiting for him to get off his butt. These changes in your behavior need to come from a true inner shift within yourself, as opposed to your playing a game or pretending. If the change isn't real inside you, he won't take you seriously. Next, when you have truly grown to the point that you mean what I said above, you have to demand that he enter couples therapy with you. And if he refuses to do so, then it's up to you to decide if you want to continue being deprived by a husband who represents one or both of the parents who let you down, you're going to stay with him. And if you decide that you're done doing this dance with him, you're going to let him know that you're ready to end the relationship. And this strong stance may just move him to work on the marriage and himself. So the point is, healing yourself is the pebble in that proverbial pond. Because when you focus on healing your old scar, and I want you to read Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, because you're going to pay particular attention to the chapter on battle scars, which is going to help you identify exactly what went wrong for you as a kid, where your wound lies, and then show you what you need to do for yourself. Once you identify it, you need to start giving yourself the emotional healing and correction that you didn't get as a kid. Instead of trying to get it from him, you give it to yourself. The beautiful part about this is that once you are strong and you know you can take care of yourself, you don't need him. The minute you don't need him and you're ready to walk, oh, that's usually the wake-up call that another person who's as self-absorbed as, self as he is needs to wake up. And if he doesn't wake up, oh well, you're moving on to a better life. Okay? So... I want all of you to remember what I said about partial identification, but don't use partial identification where you're trying to understand the other at your, to, the, to your own detriment, to where you are just repeating your own old scars and trying to understand and fix and heal another. We use it in a mutual way. We're both working to hold each other in our hearts, mutually partially identify, and help each other heal. The key word is mutual. All right? That's all I have for you this week on Ask Dr. Love Radio, and I'll see you next week.